in my sins, Jesus called my name. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you that you called my name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. I take this opportunity just to greet each and every one of you. My name is Minister Fiona Dobbin and I'm going to bring forth the word for us today. Amen. I am so blessed that I have the man Christ Jesus who loves me with an unconditional love that he was willing to leave heaven and come and die for my sins. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am so grateful today. Praise God. I just want to greet my pastor and bishop, Bishop Dr. Quiglin F. Dobbin, our first lady, Elubina Dobbin. Let's just put our hands together and bless God for them. Praise God to my fellow ministers, um, brethren in Christ, those who are tuning in with us on the live stream. May God richly bless you. We are so happy that you have joined us for worship today. And of course, I'd like to greet my um, husband, Minister Christopher Dobbin. Praise God. Let's put our hands together for him. He's having a big birthday this week. A super birthday this week. Excited about that. Praise God. Praise God. Today, um, I just want to turn our attention to the scripture that was read in our um, devotion earlier today. Um, Luke chapter 14, if you could just turn, sorry, Luke chapter 4, if you could please turn your Bibles, go there with me. Luke chapter 4. And um, from verse 14 to 21 was read, but I just want to reread um, 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And let the people of God say amen to the reading of God's word. Father, I just come before you even now. I ask you, Lord, that you will anoint my mind, anoint my heart, anoint my tongue as I speak your words. Hide me behind your cross, O God. Hallelujah. I do not glory in myself, but I glory in you. To you be all the glory and the praise. Hallelujah. Let the words of my mouth and the very meditation of my heart today, O oh God, be acceptable unto you. You are my Lord. You are my strength and you are my redeemer. God, we know your word will accomplish that which you have intended it to accomplish. So speak now in Jesus' name. And we say amen. Praise God. Today I'd like to speak to you from the topic, the greatest emancipation proclamation. The greatest emancipation proclamation. Now history records that on September the 22nd, President Abraham Lincoln issued what is referred to as the Emancipation Proclamation, which stated that as of January 1st, 1863, all individuals held as slaves within the U.S. would be thenceforth and forever free. The proclamation continued to state that the executive government of the U.S., including the military and naval authority, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons and will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them in any efforts they make for their actual freedom. That was the Emancipation Proclamation. And it is with this in mind that Carter Woodson initiated the first celebration of Negro History Week in 1926, which later became um, Black History Month. And one of the reasons Woodson chose 
February was to encompass the birthdays of two of the great Americans who played a very prominent role in the shaping of black history, namely Abraham Lincoln, who was the one who made the Emancipation Proclamation, and also the abol abolitionist, Frederick Douglass. Both their birthdays, the 12th and the 14th, are in February. And so that's why February was selected as Black History Month. Now, in as much as President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, and he should be acknowledged for doing so, there are some, especially in this climate that we have now where people are saying they are woke, there are some who believe that we should not really celebrate the man Abraham Lincoln because he did not literally engage in the fight to free slaves. This is what is being said. There are some who question whether or not he truly believed and valued blacks as equals. And so the Emancipation Proclamation, although it declared slaves free, it did not really address racial inequality in both the social and political fabrics of the nation. And so, as a result, we have, or we had what was called the Civil Rights Movement. And now, in recent times, Black Lives Matter movement. Therefore, while the proclamation or the Emancipation Proclamation was great, it was not comprehensive. There were some things that were just not addressed in this one proclamation. And so I want to submit to you that there is an even greater and more comprehensive Emancipation Proclamation than that of Abraham Lincoln because this Emancipation Proclamation addresses every area of the enslaved spiritual and physical condition because listen the root of slavery the root of racism the root of social injustice throughout history and today is a sin issue which makes it more than just a natural issue it is a spiritual issue therefore you need a spiritual emancipation proclamation to liberate us in the ways that the physical emancipation proclamation cannot and so look for records what I propose to you today as the greatest proclamation of emancipation. This is where Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel, the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal, to bind up everyone who is broken hearted, to preach deliverance to everyone who is not just in physical but emotional psychological and spiritual captivity he came for the recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised hallelujah see the scripture tells us in Luke chapter 4 that the proclamation that Jesus made was not written by him. In fact, it was written by the prophet Isaiah, which means that almost 700 years before we get to our text, that's when this emancipation proclamation was written. But Jesus, so the people who were hearing Jesus read this were very familiar with this scripture. They knew it. They recited it time after time but today was a different day because Jesus said this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears it was a written document but now it has taken full effect today today the emancipation proclamation has taken effect and so over the next few Sundays, we're going to examine this proclamation to understand its meaning, its impact as we look at the man, the message, and the movement. Hallelujah. I want to spend some time today examining the man, Christ Jesus. 
the man Christ Jesus. What we see happening in our society today is the discrediting of movements, ministries, entire careers because of all the scandals and issues that are being found in the character of men that were once viewed as prominent, that were once held in high regard. And where it comes to um, Christendom, people have walked away or are now wavering in their faith because of the character, the lack of morality in a lot of spiritual leaders. That's because people were placing their emphasis and their confidence on the wrong man. As believers, as individuals, our confidence should not be in a person, a physical person, a regular man. Yes, we have expectations, we have hopes, but we cannot build and have our foundation upon a regular man. Instead, we need to build our foundation on the man, the greatest man, the greatest emancipator, and that person is Christ Jesus. Hallelujah! On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. So be careful which man you put your confidence in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's go to Luke chapter 3 verse 21 and verse 22. Because you might ask the question, if this man is so important, who is he? If the foundation of my faith should be built on this person, who exactly is uh, this man? So Luke chapter 3 verse 21 and verse 22. And this was when Jesus was being baptized. It reads, and the Holy Ghost, sorry, verse 21. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved son, in thee or in whom I am well pleased. So for the purpose of this discourse, I firstly present Jesus to you as the son of God. Hallelujah. In the event there is a case of mistaken and false identity or paternity, God himself spoke in a very audible way to make everyone know the true paternity and identity of Jesus. Now, why is that relevant? Because when Jesus made his emancipation proclamation, when he said, now is the scripture fulfilled, the first thing the people who were around him said, is this not Joseph's son? Which means they could not accept what he was saying because they only saw him as Joseph's son. They saw him as a commoner. They saw him as a little boy who used to run around here. They saw him as just another child who is now going to make a boast. But I need us to understand this was no ordinary son. This was no ordinary son. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so because they did not understand his paternity and his identity, they completely rejected what he said. Because when you read, they were ready to stone Jesus after this. Because they were so upset that what they thought was a regular person was making such a mighty claim that in fact I am the great emancipator. And so they're saying there is no way this regular boy, Joseph's son, the carpenter's son, 
could make such a claim to such a great and important proclamation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so I want us to understand God is saying first and foremost, let me set the record straight. Although Joseph, and we really have to salute and celebrate Joseph because Joseph was raising a son that was not biologically his. So it was a good thing that he did. But God is saying we need to make a distinction that although Joseph, Joseph is hailed as the father of Jesus, he really is not the true father. In fact, I am his daddy. Hallelujah. And if you know who his daddy is, it tells you something about his identity. It tells you that this is a different child because of who his daddy is. His daddy was the one who created, that spoke the world into existence. It was his daddy who said, let there be light and there was light. It was his daddy who stooped down and formed man from the dust and blew breath into him. It was his daddy who released Moses to go and free the people out of Egyptian slavery and bring them into the promised land. It was his daddy who showed up at the Red Sea and at the Jordan River so that the children of Israel can go through on dry land. Hallelujah. That's who Jesus' daddy is. We call him Yahweh. We call him Adonai. We call him Elohim. We call him Jehovah. He is the all-powerful God. The all-knowing God. The all-present God. That's who his daddy truly is. Hallelujah. And so if we know who Jesus' daddy is, then we know that he was not on earth just to be another regular person. We know that he came on a mission, that he was sent to fulfill a purpose. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He came on official business in Luke 2 documents the story of Joseph and Mary taking Jesus to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. They accidentally left him behind. Now, that is a terrible, terrible thing, terrible situation to be in. Because I want us to understand the magnitude of the number of people who were physically located in Jerusalem. If you can think pre-pandemic, what Times Square looks like on New Year's Eve, that's the magnitude of people. Or the Macy's um, Thanksgiving Day Parade. That's how many people were there. And to lose your child in all of that, with no cell phone, thank you, Minister Caron, to text them. No cell phone to call and ask, um, where are you? We have gone a whole hundred miles already and we just realized that you are not, where are you? There was no cell phone and so imagine the panic, imagine the concern of Mary and Joseph and when they finally went back to the temple and found Jesus, Mary said, son, why in the world would you do such a thing to your mother and your father? Do you not realize how scared and how petrified we were Jesus in his 12 year old self says but why were you even looking for me why what kind of a question is that when you see that your parents are concerned and upset that is not the time to ask that kind of question but I love what Jesus said because Mary says son your mother and your father were concerned but Jesus says look mother why are you searching for me do you not know that I must be about my father's business so he told his parents his paternity his father is really not Joseph but it is God and even as a 12 year old boy he was fully aware that that was his mission that he came to be about his father's 
business. So not only is he the son of God, but he is the sent and anointed one. See, Matthew, Mark, and Luke records Jesus' question to his disciples about his identity. He asks them firstly, who do men say that I am? What are they saying about my identity? And they said, you know what, Jesus, some people think that you're actually John the Baptist. Some of them think you're Elijah. Some think you're Jeremiah. That's because people in those days, they believed in reincarnation. So they thought that you can come back, somebody from the past could come back in the form of somebody else. So that's what some people were saying. But Jesus said, who do you? say that I am. Who do you say that? And Peter declared, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus's response was that Peter, upon this rock, and let's clarify, it's upon this revelation because human understanding could not have revealed this to you. But it was God the Father who revealed my true identity. And it is upon that revelation that I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. So this means that the very foundation of our belief as Christians rests upon what we accept and believe as the paternity and the identity of Christ. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. See, Christ is not a last name. So you have Fiona Dobbin, that Jesus Christ, Christ was not his last name. Christ specifically means it's a title for the sent or anointed one. That's the translation of the Christ. So when Peter says, thou art the Christ, he was saying, you are the sent and anointed one from the Father. And because of that, Jesus says, I build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail. He was sent by the Father. He says, I must do the work of him who sends me while it is still day. Because there comes a time when no man shall work. He was anointed. So he was sent, released by his father, but also anointed by the Holy Spirit to emancipate those who have been enslaved. Now when we go to Luke 1 verse 34 and 35, we meet upon Gabriel visiting Mary. And he says to her, Mary, you are going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Mary says, hold up. How is that going to happen? How is that even possible seeing that I am still a virgin but then the angel explicitly states that the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee therefore also this holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the son of God. So the Holy the anointing of the Holy Spirit was upon the womb of Mary that gave birth to the seed and the person of Jesus Christ. We also see the second time when Jesus was being baptized in Luke 2. It says the Holy Spirit descended like a dove on him. And I love that it didn't stop there, but the Luke made it very clear in chapter 4 verse 1 and Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost was led to the into Jordan by the Spirit so he received that anointing and it says he was then filled with the Holy Ghost and then after his time in the wilderness verse 14 of Luke 4 states and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit unto Galilee. 
So he was sent by his father and was anointed to do the work that his father sent him to do. Listen me, when Isaiah says it is the anointing that breaks the yoke, this is what he was referring to. The spirit of the Lord was upon Jesus because he was being anointed to break the yokes, to break the bondage of sin, to set at, kept, set at liberty those who were captive and held hostage by sin. It is not by human understanding. It is not in human strength or power, but it is by the spirit of the living God. Hallelujah. It is the spirit of God that makes the difference. And so Jesus in flesh needed to be anointed, to be a saint. How much more then we as individuals, we need the anointed. We need that anointing. Hallelujah. And I'm glad that the anointing was not just there for Jesus, but the anointing is available today for each and every one of us because of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The anointing makes the difference. And so whoever the Son sets free, because of that anointing, he is free indeed. Can someone just worship God for the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus? Who oh, the sun sets free. We don't have to question it. We don't need to look back. Hallelujah. We are free indeed. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. Don't allow the enemy to rehearse and repeat your past transgressions because you have been liberated. You have been set free. Hallelujah. 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 I've got my freedom. Praise. I've got my freedom. Dance. I know who I used to be. I know who Christ has liberated me from. So I am free. I'm no longer shackled to sin. But I'm free in Christ Jesus. I'm free. Free to lift my hands. Free to worship. I'm free to walk in the anointing of Jesus Christ. We are free people. We are free people. I need us to begin to act like free people. See, I love Robert Nestor Marley's song, Freedom Song or Redemption Song, specifically the second verse, which says, Emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but yourselves can free. Now, there are two things. One, what Nestor or Bob Marley was saying, we are no longer physically shackled as slaves but there's a slavery of the mind that is still taking place that we're still trapped in a particular mentality but i want to disagree with bob marley today because he says none but ourselves can free i disagree with that i cannot free my mind i need the true son of god who was anointed he is the one who liberates and frees my mind from every destructive element. He is the one who delivers my mind. He delivers my soul. He delivers my way of thinking. He delivers me from an eternity in hell. He is the one who delivers me. Because of him I am free. I am free. Come on, say it out of your mouth. I am free. I am free. I am free. Hallelujah. Free. Thank you, Pastor Norman, by the grace of God. No longer bound. Hallelujah. I am free. Thank you, Jesus. Freedom in the name of Jesus. Freedom in the name of Jesus. Freedom by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. He is the son of God. He is the sent and anointed one. But I also want to submit to you that he is the second Adam. 
See, Matthew and Luke are the only two gospel writers who chronicle the genealogy of Jesus. When we go to Matthew's genealogy, he's going to tell us that this genealogy starts with Abraham, and then he's going to point to David and then to Jesus. So even when you look at Matthew chapter 1, it says the genealogy of the son of man, sorry, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and it's going to chart his genealogy that way. But Luke does not, in the order of reading Luke's gospel, he does not place the genealogy at the birth of Jesus, which is what Matthew did. Luke takes a different approach. And let's go over to Luke chapter 3 to see the different approach that Luke takes <clears throat> when given the genealogy of Jesus. Now I want us to note that verse 22 or the ending part of verse 22 has God saying, thou art my beloved son, in whom or in thee I am well pleased. And then immediately begins the genealogy. The genealogy goes all the way back, and if we jump to verse 38, it says it goes all the way back. It says the son of Enos, who was the son of Seth, who was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. Why does Luke place the genealogy here? I want us to know that there is a connection to be made to the first man who is referred to as the son of God and the second Adam who God says is his beloved son. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so to understand the relationship between Adam, the first Adam, and the second Adam, Jesus, let's go over to Romans chapter 5 because I love the way Paul explains this for us. I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. From verse 12 of Romans 5, it says, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Yes, people sinned before the law was given, but it was not counted as sin because there was not yet any law to break. Still, everyone died. From the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even those who did not disobey an explicit commandment of God as Adam did. Now, Adam is a symbol, a representation of Christ who was yet to come, verse 15. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man Jesus Christ and the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin for Adam's sin led to condemnation but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God even though we are guilty of many sins for the sin of this one man Adam caused death to rule over many but even greater someone says greater hallelujah but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness for all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Verse 18, yes. Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone. But Christ's one act 
act of righteousness hallelujah brings a right relationship with God and a new life for everyone because one person disobeyed God many became sinners but because one person obeyed God many will be made righteous and so when you look at that we will better understand that the first man because of the first man's sin the destiny the of of the entire human race because it says after that we were all born in sin and shapen in iniquity because of the sin of one man but I'm so glad that there is a second Adam who comes to bridge the gulf between God and between man see this second Adam was the perfect son of God he did not sin although he was tempted although he walked this earth in human flesh he did not falter and he did not fail so because of this man Christ Jesus because of his obedience because of his sacrifice because of him the second Adam we have the opportunity to be restored with God We have that opportunity for reconciliation. What was broken, what was divided, now the second Adam steps in and fills the gap and makes the pathway straight. So what the first Adam messed up and did, the second Adam came and corrected so that all humanity, it does not matter where you come from. It does not matter your race. It does not matter your age. It does not matter your identity. By this one man, this one man, we now have access to the very throne of God. Hallelujah. This one man. So this is no ordinary man. No ordinary man. No ordinary man. He gives me access. He is the restorer. He reconciles me back to Christ, to God. And so this is why we stand in the name of Jesus. We are covered by the blood of Jesus because he is the one who bridges the gap. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that even though under the first Adam we were on our way to hell whoever believes in the second Adam shall have life and have it more abundantly he changed the trajectory of my story I was destined for a Christless eternity but Jesus came and filled the gap He's God's gift of humanity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so Luke, in presenting the second man, he said, second Adam, he's also saying to us that while Matthew was interested in presenting Jesus as the son of David and the son of Abram, because Matthew was talking to a Jewish audience. And so for the Jews, it was important that they understand the kingship of Jesus, that he is the Messiah. But Luke, by God, Going all the way back to the first man said, listen, he is not just the sent and anointed one to the Jews, but he is the sent and anointed one to every man on this earth. So I do not subscribe to the view that Christianity is a white man's religion because he is the son of God. He goes all the way back to the first man and therefore applies to all men his work is for everyone not just some people he does not discriminate Adney, Adney. I'm glad some places you go they might discriminate against you but Jesus does not discriminate it doesn't matter what your sin was like yes your penalty or what you did was really messed up but when you stand before the throne God says though your sins were as scarlet because of Jesus I make them white as snow I make them, I throw them in the sea of forgetfulness to be remembered
no more. Hallelujah. 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 Come on and worship God. No discrimination. No discrimination. Whoever will. Anyone. Anyone has the opportunity. And we need to stop telling people that they accept Jesus and then they have to do this or no, no, no. Accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior is the only requirement for a new life. That is it. That is all we have to do. Accept Jesus Christ as Savior. No ifs. But see, here is why this is important. When God said, this is my beloved son, he says, in whom I am well pleased. Please notice, at this point in time, Jesus had not performed not one miracle. He had not done one thing. And God says, in him, I am well pleased. So when we go to the wilderness experience, the enemy challenged his identity. The enemy said to him, if thou be the son of God, then turn these stones into... Devil, what do you mean by if thou be the son of God? God himself already declare and seal your sonship. You don't need to prove it. You don't need to do anything for people to realize and to know that you are an accepted son and daughter of God. That is the word of God. That is the truth of the gospel. Come as you are. Thank, thank you very much, auntie. He is responsible to do the rest of the work in you. It is not of works lest any man should boast. We can't do anything to earn the love of God. To earn our position as sons and daughters. See, in regular life, we want to do things and to put on our resume so that we are more attractive for that new job or we are more attractive for a promotion. But I'm so glad that I don't need to do anything for God to put his seal of son or daughter on me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus is applicable to all men. Hallelujah. 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 It's a free gift. The free gift. It cost him a whole lot. But for you and I, it's a free gift. A free gift. Hallelujah. As I prepare to close, one of the reasons we can celebrate this man, Christ Jesus, is that he's a human being. The word of God says we have a high priest who can be touched by the feelings of our infirmities. Sometimes we fail to accept people as leaders, as celebrities, because we feel they don't relate to who I am. They can't identify with my struggle. They can't identify with my situation. But the word of God says Jesus was tempted at all points. He knows what it means to live in a world that you're constantly tempted. You are facing constant bombarding, constant struggle, struggles, constant opposition. He knows what that means because he experienced it. In the wilderness, at his most vulnerable point, after 40 days of fasting, when physically he is hungry, he is weak, that is when the enemy steps in and dangle in front of him food. But Jesus, the perfect man, says, 
devil, first of all, you came to me wrong because you are trying to get me to prove I am the son of God. I don't need to do that because man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, every word that proceeded from the mouth of so what human food cannot do God does in the person of Jesus Christ and so this is why as believers we discipline ourselves in fasting to slay the flesh and be fed by the spirit of God so we are not just eating and filling our physical bodies, but the spirit man is revived and renewed. So Jesus, a human being, experienced fatigue. He needed to rest and to sleep. As much as he was anointed, did excellent miracles, he needed rest. He needed rest. My favorite one is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus had a moment of extreme anguish. When he realized the weight of what he had to do, he said, Father, if it be possible, I, I, I don't want to go through with this. This is too much. This is a lot. This is heavy. This is my human flesh. This is heavy. For me to take on the weight of all the sins of everyone past, the sins of everyone present, the sins of everyone to God, this is a lot. This is a bitter cup. Let this cup, let this cup pass from me. Hallelujah. Let this cup pass from me. He then says, nevertheless, not my will. It is not what I want to do, what I feel like doing, but it is for your will. He knows what it means to deny himself. Even when he was on the cross, he dealt with rejection from his father. He said, Father, why are you forsaken me? He understands the human condition which is why he is the perfect emancipator. Will you stand? Hallelujah. 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 Can someone just bless God for the man Christ Jesus? The man Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, the son of the living God, the sent and anointed one, the second Adam, the son of man. If there is a person under the hill who does not know Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, today, today is your day of deliverance. Hallelujah. Today is your day of emancipation. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wherever you are, this is the moment where Jesus can become your Savior and your Lord. Hallelujah. If that is you and you're in this building, will you raise your hand to say, I want to know this man, Christ Jesus. Or even those who are streaming online, you can go ahead and put in the comments and we will reach out to you to guide you through this process. Hallelujah. It's a beautiful thing to experience emancipation from the perfect man, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am free. Praise the Lord.